Welcome to Library Out Loud, a conversation about any and all things related to the Spokane County Library District. Library Out Loud is brought to you by the Spokane County Library District and our friends at STCU. Now, here's your host, Jane Baker. Hello and welcome to Library Out Loud. I'm Jane Baker with the Spokane County Library District. Talking with me today is Timothy Ely, an artist, bookbinder, uh, amazing person all around. Uh, you've been on our program before and we talked about uh, you coming to the, the lab at North Spokane and sharing your, your artistic work with people and, and that was great. But today we're going to talk more about libraries and the history of books. You love libraries. Probably probably as much as I do, if not more. And um, I can just feel the passion and hear it from you when we're talking about this. So who better to talk about libraries and the history of books? So how do you start a conversation on the history of books? Well, you know, we probably all start with our libraries and our grade schools. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember very vividly being kind of sequestered off to the children's book section where there lo there's lots of pictures, 32-page books. To me, at that age, they were silly. Uh -huh. And um, I kept going over to the other shelves, um, and the first book I ever checked out was called The Wild because it was thick, and I wanted to read this. I, I didn't know what it was about, um, and I would read it. It was tough because um, was, there was a lot of book there. Sure. But... Um, you went straight I was, for that there was substance. still this resistance to, you know, you really need to stay over in the kids' section because you're a kid. Hmm. And um, I was a, a bit offended by that, but um, the public library was um, not far away, and it was on my way home uh, after school. And the librarian had been my uh, kindergarten teacher, mm -hmm. so I had a, a very sympathetic ally there. And um, that library was just wide open to me. I could check out anything. Sure. And I checked out a lot of things that I had no comprehension of, mm -hmm. weird math books that I just had no idea what I was reading. Mm -hmm. um, but visually, they were really fascinating. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, so as I began to uh, age, as we do, um, the high school library was good. Um, then I went to the Everett Public Library, and I had a, a science teacher in junior high that took me with him to um, the extension classes he was taking at the University of Washington. Wow. So in the eighth grade, wow. <clears throat> I was a kid lurking in Suzalo. Mm. And um, I met a graduate student who was a scientist, because I think he was curious about what's this kid doing here. Sure. And, um, and I'm finding books on glass blowing, making lab apparatus. And it was just like, this is just the most amazing thing I could imagine. Mm -hmm. And so he said, well, come up with me to the chemistry building. And he gave me just a whole pile of stuff to build something out of. I figured, well, a death ray maybe, I don't know. But there's, there's a lot of possibilities <laughs> here because you're just putting things together. Yeah. But that library um, was so vivid. And I, I wouldn't get back there until I was in graduate school. Wow. But the Suzalo Library now boasts a great collection of uh, artist books mm -hmm. and very unusual things similar to what I am engaged in. Mm -hmm. um, but I discovered that libraries also were really pivotal things for getting answers to whatever questions I might have. And mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's a really simple idea, but um, if you just take it for granted, um, it, it's not very impactful. But when you really are tuned in to the notion that this is a resource that is rare mm -hmm. um, and that you can go in and get a book or a movie or a something for two weeks, three weeks mm -hmm. for free mm -hmm. um, is is quite unbelievable. And my old library in Snohomish was uh, a Carnegie library. Yeah. And I think that they're working to restore that building. Oh, um, nice. But I almost can't go through a town without, if I know there's a Carnegie library there, I want to at least do a drive-by and mm -hmm. see that structure because mm -hmm. um, 
Carnegie was, um, well, there were a lot of things about his life that we might disagree with, but um, his idea of libraries should be available um, was very formidable. Yes. And so that library in, in my hometown was built the year my mother was born, and so she was familiar with it. Wow. And um, <clears throat> it's still there. Wow. Um, That's great. The new incarnation is built on the hospital grounds where I was born. Oh, so interesting. Just weird little combinations. Mm -hmm. but, um, but all these things, the libraries turned me on to book binding. My first book binding book, um, besides the one I purchased, was found in the Snohomish Public Library. Mm -hmm. And I began to realize that this thing was sort of self-feeding, that books about books, books about book binding um, was my initial entry into this craft. And then books became um, influences for the visual work. So mm -hmm. science books began to um, generate images, math books, astronomy books, atlases, mm -hmm. all these things uh, were available uh, as a resource and were triggers for my weird imagination. Wow, that, that's fabulous. And, and you say maybe about eighth grade this started with you? Uh, yeah, yeah I, was, well, I was making books earlier. I had my own stapler. <laughs> and uh, so I was stapling paper to get paper together and sure. sharing it with my friends. And, um, and we were, mm, it feels like it was often, it probably was much more seldom, but um, not infrequently we were sent to the office to talk to Stan, the principal, and try to keep our minds on more uh, academic um, pursuits. Yeah, but stapling pieces yeah. of paper together yeah. and... Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I, I'm assuming, uh, and you could probably kick me under the table for this, I'm, I'm assuming it's more than one of those flip books that we oh, used yeah, to make when we were, were kids. Were fairly elaborate comic books. Really? Yeah, yeah. Really? So a friend and I, would he would write stories. He was he had better handwriting than I would, so uh, uh -huh. than I have, so he was the letterer. Okay. And we'd both draw and swap them and keep drawing. And um, he he tells me he still has some in his archive. Is that right? And, um, <laughs> Why not save some of those first ones, right? Yeah. 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 So then where did it go from there? So so um, how awesome, though, that you uh, went to a se separate section in the library, you know, because uh, oftentimes we hear, oh, uh, parents will say, my child doesn't like to read. And we just say they haven't found the right book yet. So um, we wouldn't, you know, our county libraries would not discourage a child from going to the other section mm -hmm. of, of the library because who knows where, what they're going to find as with your example as well. But then where did you go from there? Um, you, you know, you said you had gone to this with a teacher mm -hmm. and how great for that teacher to include you and, and expose you to that information that, that you were learning. But then where did it go from there? And what were your next steps? Well, a, a, probably that biggest leap is when I'm in graduate school, when I discovered that I actually wanted to make books, mm -hmm. that I wanted to formally start taking my drawings and my prints and figuring out a way to at least organize them into a portfolio or a box. And mm -hmm. that seemed to suggest book binding. Okay. And I couldn't find a book binder um, except trade binders that worked in big basically factories in downtown Seattle, and they had no interest in handwork or tiny numbers. They were talking, well, you know, we can make we can make a thousand sketchbooks for you. And I went, well, that's a bit daunting. Wow. I don't need that many. I just want to learn how to make one. one. <laughs> um, and, but, you know, I, um, education is never convenient. So I started just looking around, and I gradually um, found a teacher. I ended up having to go to England to actually find book binders that would take me on and, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. answer my questions. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I came back and began to look for equipment, mm -hmm. uh, which was mostly hunts through junk stores or repurposing tools from other disciplines, woodworking, weaving. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of materials out there that can be brought into this game. So, <clears throat> excuse me, so it's very possible mm -hmm. to get the stuff we want. Mm -hmm. um, it's just not as direct as, say, going to Spokane art and buying oil paints and brushes and canvases. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, this was more challenging. Yeah. But the libraries um, kept providing me with things like old book binding catalogs. Mm -hmm. And I was able, while I was in England, to track down um, businesses that had sold um, to another firm and were merged but still had bits of equipment. Um, the wow. Limehouse area had been bombed pretty thoroughly during the war, so all the um, finishing tool makers were gone. But um, I found a couple of guys down on the 
south coast that had just started making bookbinding tools. Wow. And um, they're still working. We're mm -hmm. still friends. Mm -hmm. uh, I was one of their first customers. Mm -hmm. And um, I came home with a suitcase full of gear. Mm -hmm. Wow, that sounds like a very productive trip. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So, so you're self-taught. For the uh, most part. For the most part. And, and then now you teach uh -huh. we, we had been talking uh, earlier about you you had a, a class recently with several uh -huh. people in it so now you teach these workshops uh -huh. who comes to you for these workshops um, I've had textile artists from all over the country um, one of them came from England a few years ago um, people that are already engaged in making books at some level people mm -hmm. that have interests in it uh, some people are, are librarians mm -hmm. uh, that now want to actually uh, get physical with the books in a different way than, than reshelving let's yeah, say sure. uh, <laughs> and uh, and then other artists um, sculptors um, oh interesting so it's it's you know it's it's a craft it's it's a teachable measurable um, set of material conditions mm -hmm. so a person is folding paper is painting paper is mounting fabric to turn that into book cloth mm -hmm. um, we're sewing we're gluing we're trimming we're, we're building an object that's very referential to the last two or three hundred years of bookmaking mm -hmm. you know it's all most of the stuff we're doing theoretically is post Gutenberg so we're looking at how books changed after print came into a great play and how these books um, because of their, the you know Let's see which we call it. the availability um, make readers of us all. Yes, they yes. make you know literacy very possible. Yeah. So if somebody was interested in your bookbinding workshops, aside from the ones we have at the library, mm -hmm. um, do you have a website or a contact info? Yeah, I have a very basic website with contact info. Um, it's been in in the works for years okay um, but we just never get it off the dime but you can reach me through that okay and the url for that uh just look up my name and it'll it'll be the first hit you'll get okay timothy, so, timothy e ely yeah. e -L -Y. Yeah. okay great get them there. we're going to come back and talk more about books and libraries in just a moment uh, but we've got to take a quick break here on library out loud hi i'm larry myers owner of river ridge hardware Welcome to our garden center here on the corner of Garland and Driscoll. We have fresh plants that come in weekly from all of our local growers. We can make your garden look like our garden. Here at River Ridge, we've been here 30 years. We're your full service neighborhood hardware store. This is our sprinkler aisle where my knowledgeable staff will help you put together your sprinkler system so it will make your yard lush, green, for the spring and summer. This is River Ridge Hardware's rental center where we provide a multitude of equipment for rent for the do-it-yourselfer. Next time you're working on your home or yard this spring and summer, stop by, say hi, and we'll help you get the project done. See you tomorrow night, and thanks again for taking care of the painting. I got this. Bye. Weekends are made for painting. Let the experts at Rada Paint take care of you. Hi. This looks amazing. Rada Paint, over 80 years of quality, tradition, and trust. Find it in every can. Hello there, Internet. My name is Braden Magruder, and I'm just coming out of the Spokane Talks building, and I'm excited to bring to you guys a new announcement that I am going to be the new host of the Youth Spotlight program. Now, our old host, Colin, he's off to Texas Christian University to pursue a degree in theater and broadcasting, and you know what? That's great for him, but that's what I like to call adulting. And you know, I don't think that we have time for adulting with the Youth Spotlight program. What the Youth Spotlight program is here to do is to bring to you guys news, the greatest news of some of the most amazing people here throughout Spokane that are, what, 
just going in high school, maybe about to go into college, you know? These people are achieving life's dreams and they are so young. And I think that these are stories that you guys should know about. And I'm so excited to be bringing them to you. Now I'm a Spokane native myself. I've been performing throughout Spokane and various different shows. I just closed the show of Music Man and you know, I guess I like long walks on the beach, keeping my business attire, while also keeping my french fry socks on close at hand. You know, it's going to be a great year and I'm so excited to be your guys' host. So tune into Youth Spotlight to watch me interview some of the most amazing people. Thank you and have a great day. Hello and welcome back to Library Out Loud. I'm Jane Baker and we're talking today with Timothy Ely, an artist and bookbinder from the area here. And what a joy to have you on the program and for you to bring these great, great books and, and to have this whole conversation with you. During the break, we were just talking about, you said you had worked on a book that ended up taking you 15 years. Right. One book. One book. Yeah. This is the model for it. And this is the model for it, and this is absolutely beautiful. Um, just and, and so the actual book, this is the model, so the actual book was much bigger. About 15 inches high okay. by 11, closed, and mm -hmm. weighs about 12 pounds, I think. 12 pounds, wow. Um, so the the book well let's talk about this book uh if this is a model was this a book that somebody asked you to do or something that you just wanted to do no, on your own I, I built this one to actually find out what's going to happen how much swelling am i going to get because every piece of thread that runs through every folio um that thread is about twenty thousandths of an inch thick uh -huh. so you multiply that times 40 and you get something that's that's maybe 30 percent the thickness so it has to go someplace so mm -hmm. it either gets flattened or you change thread sizes throughout the book and that was my big innovation with this was to start um, with the last sections first so 10 of them with a thick thread um, reduce the thickness for the inner 20 mm -hmm. and then go back to the thicker thread for the outside so I got this really nice uh, expansion at the top and then as the process goes on um, you can see it well, you can see it on this one. This little edge here is formed um, by putting the book into a press, compressing it slightly, and forming shoulders. And then these cover boards essentially bump up and leverage against those shoulders. Mm -hmm. So there were some things that I wanted to be able to calculate out on this bigger book because um, sometimes there's, you know, something goes wrong, there's no going back. And um, I like that kind of risk, but it's, it's literally tightrope walking over an alligator pond mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't want to have to go back so I like to build models and try to get cagey about what's going to happen with this thing and I wanted to explore uh, the end band patterns these little embroidered devices at the top that mm -hmm. um, I'm very fond of mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. and then just look at surface design uh, what do I want the book to look like what do I want it to feel like the one that uh, res the, the final book didn't resemble this one at all oh, really? except in thickness <laughs> oh okay uh, so the same number of drawings are there okay um, wow so so you have the drawings uh -huh. you start with the drawings that's the is that the first thing you do yeah you know, I get a big pile of paper I fold it down sometimes I paint it with a gelatin size to give it a little bit more tooth um, so that some of the inks don't react the way they do or the okay. watercolor will sit on top. Okay. Um, and then those drawings uh, float around the shop and um, I'm, I'm working on one now. It's only 12 folios, but they're all 22 by 11, so they're taking up a lot of space. And um, I keep thinking that by Friday I'll have these finished uh -huh. and then it's three Fridays from now. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the big process is mm -hmm. getting the drawings done and I usually can't tell if it actually is a book until I, I sew it together so I may sew it like this one just lightly no glue no linings just so I can see it and page through it without it being in pieces because mm -hmm. there's a dynamic of, of folios coming together and contact at those edges visually is not to be believed until it's done so it's, okay. so, so sometimes they come together and then sometimes maybe you stitch it together and go, nah, this no, isn't no. working. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It either isn't finished yet or there's um, some kind of cross linkage visually that isn't gotcha. complete. Yep. And so sometimes it only takes a line or two to bring unity into it. 
And other times it's like, oh, this is hopeless. Um, <laughs> I don't make very many mistakes anymore, so I don't lose folios the way I did a long time ago, which uh-huh. was probably maybe a quarter of the book might get ditched and have to be done over. Oh, just, wow. But, wow. you know, it's part of the process because things go wrong and you're doing – It's I, to me, a work day is like risk assessment. So you do something – and then you pile the next idea onto it, and then another one happens. So every creative decision um, is a little challenging. And then when one of them goes wrong, like it did yesterday, um, I have to figure out a way to dance with that. Uh. And I'm definitely not going to discard that folio, but I've got an area about as big as my hand that is just not right. Mm. And so, um, Mm -hmm. you know, it's too salty, Mm -hmm. it's too sweet, it's too weird, Um, it doesn't work. So there are some solutions, um, and I just have to figure out now what is the right one, and and it also has to integrate if it looks wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And my wife is really good at spotting when I've fixed something. Oh, that wasn't there originally, was it? Uh, was it? No, yeah. it wasn't. We, we all have critics like that, right? <laughs> but interesting, you mentioned salty and sweet. Um, earlier when we were talking, uh, you mentioned correlation with food uh-huh. and book binding. Can you talk more about that? Oh, I would love to. Um, <sighs> I see a huge connection between the bindery and the kitchen. Uh-huh. So things like um, the, the leftover white in an eggshell after I've made breakfast, uh, i put that in a little container and I mix that with water uh-huh. and it goes upstairs and that could be mixed with pigment to become paint or the glue on the spine of this book for sure was basically made out of um, chicken stock really beef stock or cooked up bones uh, it's hide glue animal glue uh, you know when we used to talk about sending the horse off to the glue factory mm-hmm. well that horse would be rendered down into um, a treacly substance that would either be sold dry or in buckets with glycerin in it to keep it flexible Mm -hmm. so um there's animal glue on this spine interesting Um, wheat flour wheat starch corn starch uh, all these starches from asian grocery stores all can be cooked with water to make a slurry of paste which is what is library paste Mm -hmm. and so there's a lot of food stuff so egg white egg shell egg yolk for egg tempera paintings Mm -hmm. Um, i hauled along my egg tempera book just in case we Ran out of things to talk about. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I can't make a loaf of bread without noticing that the gluten network is, you know, the bread's forming nicely, and the gluten that, um, in the flour is one of the components that's helping to keep the leather on that book. So this, there's basically flour and water cooked up holding this leather on, oh. and it'll hold it on there for hundreds of years. Wow. Wow, that's and, fabulous. Um, but also... Not just the ingredients, but there's a little bit of a process, mm-hmm. too. Um, mm-hmm. You talked about when you're cooking something, uh, it's more than just following the recipe and throwing it all together, that there was more to it. And you kind of correlated that with the book binding process. Yeah. Well, for me, uh, I like procedure, but I like the questions that are in between the spaces. Yes. And so uh, I had enough chemistry in high school and in college that when I was studying in England, one of my teachers was one of these egg white users on leather. So she would tool her books with a little hot branding iron tool, and there would be some egg white in an impression, gold leaf is laid over that, and then you basically cook the egg white to fuse the gold to the leather. And it's a process we've been doing for 500 years in, in Europe. And um, But Daphne was not interested in the chemistry, and but she would only use egg white because the other option, the gold wasn't as bright. And so I wanted to figure out why that would be. Uh-huh. And um, it turned out to be very simple that when you, when egg white is uncooked, it's clear. As soon as you cook it, it turns white. Sure. Well, gold is so thin that the light reflecting, refracting up through that bit of leaf um, is actually bouncing off that white ground that you just tooled below that. And it's, it's just a, you know, it's a minor thing, but, um, and it's very arcane. And it may not even be correct Uh but it seems correct enough to be true so it um, works it works it works it works well wow Um, it's a little harder um in this part of the world because it's pretty dry here Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. i've when i first moved to the area there our first summer here the humidity got down to like 10 Mm percent and things were just drying Mm -hmm. so quickly that it um it was like we need to just take the rest of the day off this isn't working Uh but the rest of the year this isn't 
unbelievably great climate for building books. <sighs> Things just are stable. And so um, all these arcane processes um, that I like to look kind of in between the edges of. I, I want to make my inks, I want to make paints, um, and I want to test them and see what else can I do with this? How, how far can I push this until it either structurally fails or there's no color left or it's just you know, it becomes silly. But every one of these things is a, is a line of questions that are, I think, really, really valuable. Valuable and, and worth following that line yeah. to the answer. Yeah. Oh, Tim, it is fabulous having you here on the program, and I, I do hope that I can have you come back again someday Love and to. we can talk about whatever we want to talk yeah. about. I, I could probably talk with you all day. Cool. Um, and, and I'm sure uh, anyone else who meets you can do the same thing, and they can meet you up at the North Spokane Library through the month of October. You're mm -hmm. one of our creators and residents. So I suggest going by the North Spokane Library on Wednesdays between 10 and 2 and talk with Tim and find out more about this fascinating process and, and all the fascinating things you have to say. Like I said, we could talk all day. So thanks for being on yeah. the program. And um, if you want to find out more about Tim and, and the work he does, we have a Q&A on the scld.org website. Or just search for Tim's name, Timothy Ely, E-L-Y, and see if you can find his site and your blog. All Information right. Superhighway. That's, That's it. At your disposal. That's it. Great. Thanks for being here. And we'll see you next time on Library Out Loud. Library Out Loud is produced in Spokane, Washington by SpokaneTalksOnline.com, which is solely responsible for its content. Ask a question, recommend a guest, and hear this program again online anytime at SpokaneTalksOnline.com. Library Out Loud is brought to you by the Spokane County Library District and STCU. Go visit and explore your local library today.